So I think we can start. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Um, so good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for, for joining us tonight for this special occasion. Um, so my name is Stefano Vendramin, curator in art related to the environment. And this is the 21st edition of the Fondation Tali program, Creators Facing Climate Emergency, a series of conversations in French and in English that bring together once a month an artist and a scientist or thinker to discuss their work and research regarding environmental issues and to suggest new narratives in the face of the climate crisis. I'm delighted to be here this evening with the Brazilian artist Ernesto Neto and the philosopher Michael Mada, and to share the moderation of this talk with the curator and art advisor, Claudia Petzold, who um, has also collaborated with Ernesto Neto already for the inaugural exhibition of the Sphere Ic Museen. I'm not sure I pronounced it right. An interdisciplinary creative sphere based in the jungle outside of Tulum, Mexico, focused on the connections between art, nature, ancestral knowledge, and new technologies. Just for uh, your information, the discussion will last for one hour in total. And uh, please don't hesitate to think about any questions for our guests and to leave them in the chat as we will have time to ask them later on. So to, to start off, I'm just going to introduce the two speakers today. Michael Mada, thank you for joining us today. You are a philosopher and eco-best research professor in the Department of Philosophy at the University of the Basque Country in Spain. Your writings span the fields of ecological theory, phenomenology and political thought. And you are the author of numerous books and articles on a wide range of subjects, which are all interrelated, if not obviously so at first glance. And these include, of course, the 2013 book, Pioneer, Pioneering by any means, uh, Plant Thinking, which we will discuss today, of course. Green Mass, a book on the ec ecological theory of 12th century Christian mystic saint de Garde of uh, Bingen. And this year you published Philosophy for Passengers, a philosophical guide to passengerhood with reflections on time, space, existence, boredom, our sense of self and our sense of the senses. Is there anything you'd like to add for our audience? No, that's fine. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. We'd like to, to, to welcome you here as well. Ernesto Neto, uh, you were born, of course, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, where you're based today. And uh, drawing on the lessons of minimal sculpture, minimalist sculpture, new Brazilian objectivity of the 60s and 70s, and anthropomorphic architecture, your installations immerse the viewer in colors, fragrances, and sounds, reflecting, uh, redefining the boundaries between the artwork and the audience, and simultaneously serving as models for new social environments. The contrast between the organic and the mechanical and these qualities of sensuality and tactility in your work are all deeply inherent. And you, which, and these sculptures, I think you've described as living organisms without clear limits. And of course, you've been a subject of many museum exhibitions worldwide. I won't go through the whole list, otherwise we'll be here till, uh, till the end of the talk. Um, <laughs> possibly the 2019 exhibition Sopro, at the Pinoteca of Sao Paulo, which we will refer to later, and the 57 Venice Biennale, Viva Arte Viva in 2017. Is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, Ernesto? Oh. oh, you're still on mute, Ernesto. Well, just that uh, I have a wonderful partner named Lili, and we have two boys, one named Lito and the other one named Bruno. Thank you for sharing and thank you for being here. Um, Claudia, Claudia, I'll uh, leave you the floor if you'd like to introduce the, the theme for today. Yes, um, thank you so much, Stefano, for the introduction. Welcome, uh, a very warm welcome to both Michael and Ernesto. It's such a privilege to be here this afternoon with the two of you and it's wonderful to know that you already have a connection as well. Um, and we will be exploring the topic of the vegetal soul. Uh, I think to um, help the audience tune into what will be developed, um, it is important to remember that the Earth's atmosphere uh, is a shared atmosphere and uh, it is shared with all the beings um, around us. And it's marked by a constant exchange as the plants generate oxygen and humans and animals generate carbon dioxide. One could also say that every breath is a connection. Um, 
the imprint of the vegetal soul is very much present in our DNA. And uh, Michael Marder coined the phrase of the vegetal soul being the most fundamental stratum of our soul. And uh, in my research preparing for this talk, um, I found a sentence from Ernesto's work uh, in the Venice Biennial of 2017, Viva Arte Viva, which accompanied his Pavilion of Shamans, where he says, roots share the dark, leaves breathe the light, um, which of course denotes the universality of plants and uh, the cycle of life that flows through them. I hope that today's conversation will shed light on the multiplicity of the meanings, the obscurity, and also the potentialities of plant life. Um, to jump into the topic, I think it's important to first maybe share your personal connection with plants. Uh, so uh, Ernesto and Michael, if you both could maybe pinpoint a moment where this connection uh, manifested and became more significant in your thinking, being, breathing, um, and also what some of the teachings were at that moment. That would be wonderful. Yes, sir. Ernesto, should, should I begin, uh, Claudia? <laughs> Just go on. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, thank you. First of all, once again, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this, uh, what, what looks like a very promising conversation. Uh, and of course, this is a fundamental question uh, about the connection to vegetal life. Uh, we all uh, share and have that connection. Uh, so the connection is there to begin with. Uh, but most of the time we're unconscious about it, we don't notice it. And this is not a, a, just a, a kind of a side observation. I think it's an important facet of our relation to vegetal life, which is largely unconscious. And at that unconscious level, we actually share precisely the basic stratum of the vegetal soul that you mentioned, Claudia. Uh, and uh, of course, it's also very important, those moments, those rare moments of vegetal enlightenment, I would even say, or vegetal illumination, when this unconscious connection comes to consciousness, when all of a sudden we become aware of it. Uh, for instance, when we breathe differently in a vegetal environment, in a botanical garden or in a forest, uh, one can notice that one breathes more freely with a full chest. And, and this very physiological kind of experience can uh, come to consciousness and can lead us to a greater appreciation of vegetal life. Uh, in my case, uh, even as a child, I was fascinated by plants. So I always uh, conducted very rudimentary kind of botanical studies of plants, collected leaves, created herbaria, uh, which I think is what many children actually do, but uh, this continued into my school years as well. Uh, when, when I started uh, getting interested in philosophy, plants were not at the forefront of my preoccupation, strictly philosophical preoccupation to begin with. Uh, but there was a moment around 2006 or 2007 uh, when I found myself in a very special vegetal environment, in a, a natural reserve straddling the border between northern Portugal and northern Spain uh, called Jerez. Uh, and I was fascinated by this uh, enchanted, mystical uh, feeling forest in which I found myself. So during the day, I would take long walks uh, around moss covered trees uh, in, 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 in those forest paths. And at night, I was reading a book by a wonderful uh, Italian philosopher, Claudia Baracchi, contemporary Italian philosopher on Aristotle. Uh, and it is there that she reminds us about uh, uh, Aristotle's relation to the different kinds of soul or vitality and, and mentions vegetal vitality with which Aristotle's uh, soul actually commences. And so this confluence of an actual experience of being in the forest of Jerez and of reading this particular book uh, brought uh, kind of brought together the, the two sides of an experience of and with plants, uh, the, the very um, uh, concrete uh, sense of being enveloped by a vegetal milieu and also uh, realizing that plants can give us a lot to think 
they, they, they all hold the gift of thinking uh, as much as they gift our senses with all of those sights and smells uh, and so on that, uh, uh, that they present. Uh, and so I can probably pinpoint this moment when my philosophical attention turned toward plants. And in response to the second part of your question, I, say, I would say that uh, there are three main things that we can learn from plants and that uh, appeared very clearly before me at that moment. First, uh, the importance of the surface, that the surface of being is not to be dismissed. It's not a mere shell that needs to be broken through and uh, on our path toward the valuable core, uh, which uh, uh, we would extract from the shell. But as we know, plants live on their surface. They live by maximizing their exposure with the leaves and flowers, for instance. And so we can learn a lot about a uh, different, uh, what I call an essentially superficial mode of being and thinking from plants. Uh, the uh, second thing that we can learn from plants uh, is their non-oppositional mode of being because plants are obviously, they move in all kinds of ways by growing, decaying and metamorphosing, but they are rooted in the places where they live. Uh, and so they do not oppose uh, the dangers that present themselves, but work around and, and through them uh, in the places where they are. So this non-oppositionality is another thing. And finally, uh, the multiplicity of articulations and disarticulations, a very kind of loose assemblage which allows a living being to be not a totality, not an organismic totality, but a self-reinventing uh, uh, kind of creature that is always in touch with the outside, with the others, uh, and, and always responding in the very body and embodiment of that, of that being to what is going on outside. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing this uh, path to uh, the knowledge and insight of plants. Um, Ernesto, could you maybe share your experience as well? Well, uh, bom, foi sua very nice to. Bom, thank you very much, all of you, Stefano, eh, Claudia, eh, Daily Foundation, and Michael, colleague here, and it was wonderful to hear you and feel your eh, your eh, enchantment when you talk about your childhood. You could see in your face your your every, even like if I was jumping into your childhood with the plants around and your pleasure. <laughs> with them you know and uh, because it's very interesting this thing of zoom because we stay very close to the to the face of the people now it's something that uh, when the, the the pandemic came and we begin to have so many of that i begin to have this feeling because normally in a lecture people are far away and here we have this uh, 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 relation with such a closeness and then you see the face the lips not really but anyway, uh, I'm not trying to escape from the, 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 <laughs> the question. Uh, yeah, we, I, I invite here uh, my friend Lydia to stay here a little bit with us because uh, she, is, uh, she and her family, which on the other hand is our family too, né? because they are our mother, so we are their kids, so we are the same family. Né? And they give everything for us. Né? They clean the air. They give. Yeah, they give the food. They, they give. I, for example, I, I like very much to drink mate. You see, mate is mm, the people in the south of Brazil. They call chimarrão. So I first drink that with the mm, erva mate. First, I drink that with the people uh, in the south of Brazil. Then I drink that with the people in Argentina. And finally, I drink that with the Guarani people who are uh, together with the other indigenous people. Uh, some of them, I don't know all the, all the, all the people, uh, which ones, Maputo, uh, Mapuche, uh, Guarani, whoever, who are, uh, who are the other ones who drink mate too. But they arrive in America, uh, or they begin to be drinking in America through their hands or their lips. But anyway, uh, my childhood was like very much involved with the plants. Like, he, like Michael said, I think every children 
is involved with the plants. Plants are magical, man. it's incredible. Uh, the multiplicity of it, the, the beauty of the flowers, the sweetness uh, and tenderness of the fruits, you know, the, 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 the warmness of the wood. You know, we deal with plants all the time. They are all around us. Everything we eat a plant, if we eat a cow, I don't eat cow, but if you eat a cow, the cow is eating the plant before you eat. So uh, the plants are part of us in every sense, you know. Uh, when we dress cotton, uh, we are dressing the plants, you know, because cotton is plants. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fruit, as far as I understand. It comes with a lot of seeds around it. Uh, so plants are everywhere. Beyond that, I live in Rio de Janeiro. Which there is a big forest here, full of symbiosis, mutualism, and all this, uh, this incredible dance that they are together at the same time living in all the insects. You know, I've been thinking so much about the insects because the insects, they are, they are very inside of the plants. You know, <laughs> I think there is no, no, no kind of animals who are more close, who can get closer to the plants than the, the insects. Okay, the hummingbird go there and take the, the liquid. And even the birds, they are on the trees all the time. If there is trees, there is birds. If there is no trees, there's not really much birds. Uh, but uh, the insects, they are really inside. If you see the bee, you know, moving there, around there. So you have a plant, then you see the plant and you look into the flower. And suddenly you begin to realize that's full of bees there. It takes a little while. You need to give you a little bit of time to yourself to brief that. Then my mother is a landscape designer. So my mother had been in the forest getting bromelias, getting plants. Uh, when we get older, she got a house and her house was full of plants, plants everywhere, baby plants. There is a little baby plants uh, that I just realized uh, today. She is growing here. Do you see a little baby here? Uh, so it, it, I, I grow up with these things. So plants are in my work since always, you know, uh, even the first works with like cells, you know, then from the plants, I got very much in the idea of the cells and this idea of uh, reproduction. We already talked before the no sex reproduction, the sex reproduction. So all these cells, the, the, the idea of this embryo of life is uh, very much part of my work and they get together in kind of habitats, uh, perhaps pretty much also influenced by uh, the landscape designer of my mother too. And uh, it's something that is, uh, we are totally in on it. And also uh, before I become an artist, I begin to smoke a lot of pot, marijuana, you know? And then when you begin to smoke marijuana, you begin to go to outside, you begin to go to the waterfalls, to go to the forest, because I don't know, there is something about that plant, that teaching plant, because marijuana, is also a teaching plants now. It's a, it teaches a lot. It opened my head a lot, make me see things in a in a other level of conscience. So we, it, 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 this plant looks like the, like like that. The plant begin to take you to other place, to take you to places that are their environment, take you out of your room, out of the city, to go to the edge of the city, to the stay in the countryside. So uh, then I become an artist and this was together with me, you know, the plants were there, you know. So it's, and then later, uh, I don't know, little by little, plants begin to come alive in some works of mine, you know, because uh, after talking so much about that, that I was become to have works with plants since, I don't know, six, seven, eight, uh, 10 years. And later, uh, mm -hmm. I also have this uh, great uh, opportunity, great uh, grace in my life to, to have gone to the forest, Amazon forest. I had been in Amazon forest before with my family, but at some point I was invited by a friend to meet the shamans. She said to me, you need to meet the shamans many times. And then she was going there with a, a partner of her on a book that they were doing together with the botanical garden which is a place that I always went a lot, the Botanical Garden. Also, I studied art uh, in the Museum of Art, but also at the School of Visual Arts in Park Lage. And this school is under the Corcovado Big Christ moment. And it's into the forest, you know, it's kind of this tropical uh, Mata Atlantica uh, forest, near uh, the Guarani call uh, this forest. 
big mother forest. So every time that I have a doubt about the sculpture that I was doing, I would go to the forest, you know, to the trees, to, to listen. I love to, to, to be up on the trees when I was a kid, love to climb the trees. You know, this was something you climb a tree and then you stay there uh, far away, high, looking everything, relaxing over the trunk of the branch of the, the tree, smelling the air, receiving, it's a kind of introspection. It's like going to a church perhaps, you know, that you are together with yourself. There is a level of adventure too, to climb on it and then to go down, uh, dealing with the fear, no? No, fear here, fear there, stay here, good, relax. Uh, so it's, it's the plants are everywhere. And then I went to Amazon for this uh, 2013 with this friend of mine. I met the Hunikuin people. The Hunikuin are indigenous people from Amazon forest, you know. And they are the guys, they are the masters yeah. <laughs> yeah, in this knowledge of the plants, you know. They live with the plants. The plants are their brothers and sisters in reality, you know. It's something that there's no, there's no, no word nature. Yeah. When, you say, when we say nature, we put nature outside of us every time we say nature. It's, they know all the plants. They know all about the insects and the birds and the animals. They have names for them and they know how they live. They know how you can heal with them. And through this, uh, through this convivence, they also uh, they, uh, discover that is many uh, old histories on different uh, ethnies and different people. Yawanawa, uh, Hunikui, Ashaninka, Anaimbi. Tucano, Pepamaçã, many people who deal with ayahuasca, uh, this uh, quite known uh, uh, bro that uh, everybody's talking about today because it's something really enchanted that can really guide us in a very high level of humanity, of being a, a, being, a being, of being a, a live being, of being something uh, with this transcendent conscience that it's everything one thing, we are all together in this planet, no, everything is nature, you know, this computer that are here mediating us, our nature, and all the material that is in between us up through this computer satellites and everything came from Earth, came from Mother Earth, came from what we call nature. And all the mathematics, the chemistry, the, the physics, uh, biology, all this science that comes, uh, that makes possible all this technology, it also comes from nature. So we are nature, you know, and nature are us. But uh, I had this opportunity to sing with them, to dance with them, to share uh, the medicines with them and open this incredible dimension of mind that had done some change on my work, on my, even my life, you know, uh, and becoming even more close uh, to, to the plants, to nature, or trying to be closer, you know, even though I am an artist living in this crazy environment of a city. I mean, I am someone from the city, even though Rio de Janeiro is a city with full of nature, it's still a city with a lot of walls separating us, buses, gasoline being burned, and all these uh, complicated things that uh, make us be in this climate uh, crisis and catastrophe that we are uh, very in the edge to live, or maybe already living it. But anyway, uh, I can talk about that for the whole <laughs> afternoon, you know, so. I'm and you know, that. Ernesto, just as a, as a footnote to uh, your wonderful account of how everything is nature, uh, th this is an idea that was present already in pre-Socratic thought, but was uh, later forgotten or somehow crossed uh, out already by Aristotle. Because if we look at the Greek word for nature, which is phusis, it really means uh, growth. It means the total growth and decay, of course, obviously, of everything that is. And it's a word that derives from the same verb as plant. So fuyen is to grow, fusis is nature, and futon is the plant. So nature is understood as a gigantic plant, as the growth of it. And the plant itself is not just a being among many beings, it's the growing being. So it's the being that embodies in miniature the activity of what we call nature, including ourselves, including all the artifacts that we make. Aristotle, of course, introduces the distinction between natural things and things of techne, uh, art artifice. But before him, 
uh, in pre-Socratic thought, there was much more of a unity of, of nature and the vegetal foundations of that that you are referring to as well. Mm. Yeah, you know, Plato is a problem. I think in this guy, it was Plato who really began the separation, you know, body in one place, uh, thought in another place, you know, this is, but anyway. Yes, the, meta yeah, yeah. the metaphysical divide that we uh, experienced, right? Um, I think this could be a wonderful transition to uh, maybe uh, Jenna, if you want to show uh, some of the images of Ernesto's works. Um, and we can, you know, maybe briefly go through them because uh, it is one thing to have had our own initiation to that omnipresence and wisdom of the plants, but it's another to you know, convey it and share it with people who might not be as connected to their inner child and to their uh, path through the plant world. So, um, so maybe we can, you know, we can go through the images. Can we just go back to the first image um, briefly? So this is the uh, 2017 installation in the Biennial Viva Arte Viva, um, which was, was really a biennial, very much attuned to life and the living and the being together. I don't know, Ernesto, if you want to say a few wor words uh, about the work, or if we just, you know, maybe we just flip through the works and then uh, and then we can comment on how how these works can uh, convey the experience. Yeah, this uh, this work at in the biennial is uh, is a place that I did. Uh, we opened this together with the Huni Queen people, very much connected with this connection, trying to make this bridge between the forests and the city, you know, so uh, our goal, our really desire was to uh, make some kind of uh, uh, spiritual ceremonies there, but it's a lot of restrictions and bureaucracy, so it was not possible to spend the night there, drink the medicine and these kind of things. We did some conversations over there, but in the end of the day, it's, it's a piece in the honor of the plants, you know, the plants are around there to be our uh, uh, guardians to be our inspiring to be our have we lost ernesto is it just me uh no we can't hear him we can see him but we can't hear him um ernesto i think he's frozen do you want to show some of the other images? Uh, yes, maybe in the meantime, we can go through. Um, so then this uh, installation uh, was uh, put up in the uh, Zurich train station. It was called Gaia Mother Tree. And it was again an installation that was meant to host people and uh, offer them a space, actually precisely in a, in a place of transience to you know to reconnect with themselves and the deeper movements of life rather than just running through it um, this is a picture of the interior and i was fortunate enough to attend the opening of of that uh, installation and to experience some of the ceremonies again the hunikuni were present for um, that maybe we can go to the next image so this is the exhibition in the pinacoteca de sao paulo again with um a large installation and you see uh, people gathering, uh, Ernesto standing here, um, his work as we yesterday when we were preparing for the talk we said you know the work is very much about people and plants um, and uh, we can go to the next image as well and then uh, this image is from his uh, exhibition this past spring uh, at Max Hessler Gallery in Paris you see uh, wood that is cut, uh, which refers, you know, to the pillage of the Amazon forest. Um, you see plants as well. And uh, as we were preparing for the talk, Ernesto shared with us a song that he related to this installation, which again was about the exploitation of the earth. Um, and then let's go to the next images. Oh, Ernesto is back. Amazing. Ernesto? Yeah, I'm back here. Ah, okay, good. So just um, in the meantime, we went through um, the images, we went through 
the image of Sky Yamada Tree in Zurich, um, also the image, some images of your exhibition in the Sao Paulo Pinacoteca. Uh, the Max Hetzler, maybe we can just go back to the Max Hetzler image one second. So here you see the, the wood that's cut and maybe Ernesto, you can say something about that as well. Um, you know, that's the thing that in the, when we have these lectures, for me, it's like there's always a competition between the image and the, between the talk. So I like to talk and I like okay. to make sculptures. Pictures of sculpture is something that are not so fun. But this work is a work that I made. There is a kind of uh, these layers of plywood uh, cut in a form of a root, in a form of a cut it, a tree. And in the center of it, there is the map of Africa and America uh, together, uh, like a Pangea, uh, or, or from the Guanduan, Guanduangea, I don't know, and full of uh, a soya in the center. And there is some music. In the music, there is a song that begins like that. Stop you wearing gold, gold kills. Stop taking wood from Brazil. Stop taking gold, gold kills. Because Brazil is a country for exportations uh, since the beginning of it. Was the pau Brazil, was the, then was the sugar cane, uh, then was the uh, gold, coffee, Nowadays, it's soya, oil, uh, wood, um, mining in general, iron, and other things. And this is uh, 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 something that is very problematic. For example, the gold that is destroying a lot of uh, uh, people and land and indigenous people in the Amazon forest. A part of it, for example, we discovered that was going to a kind of a company, a jewelry company in Italy, where 70% of the earrings uh, they, they, they sell in the whole Italy uh, a year is made by this company. So probably there is a lot of people who is getting married, full of love, wearing an earring <laughs> that is a lot of death and problems in their, in their fingers, you know? So it's something like that. That is, a, that is we need to stop buying this, all this, uh, all these primary goods, these commodities from uh, Amazon, if you want really to save the Amazon forest, you know, it's something like that, because Brazil is a very problematic country. We have this terrible president now, even though this is not the beginning, but this becomes devastation, becomes much more bigger now. We hope we're gonna elect uh, the old ex-president Lula and perhaps go on and get rid of this super negative moment that we live in, in Brazil and in a lot of places in the world. But this piece was really much a piece talking about this subject and about this necessity that we need to take a conscience that uh, we are all eating Amazon, you know, everywhere in the planet. Amazon and, and, and a lot of forests in Africa and in, in, the, in the whole planet, you know, that is, uh, now the technology and the modernity and the contemporary times is consuming our planet. Everybody knows about that, that is in all the newspaper, but we don't see uh, ourselves consuming it. There was an incredible uh, speech uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday from the president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, that I advise everybody to hear what he had said, because it's very important what he's saying. And the reality is that we're gonna really have to change very much our way of living uh, to, to avoid this terrible addict, addiction that we are in this consuming, that is consuming the planet and that is consuming our time and that is consuming our love, you know, is uh, breaking very much, creating a lot of walls between our uh, possible, um, how can I say, uh, expanded love, uh, collective love. Uh, and, and this situation of this, uh, of this dramatic moment that we are living, 
is going to cost a lot for us uh, psychologically and spiritually. It's going to be good, but uh, at least we could begin to stop eating meat. For example, you know, a piece of beef is like 15,000 liters of water that, uh, that is used to have a hamburger, you know. So, uh, sad, sad, sad news. It makes me think about um, something that I, I heard uh, you say, Michael Marder, which is that um, the plants can be an important access uh, for us to better understand the the environment, climate change, and and what we're what we're doing to the planet, perhaps um, perhaps it's part of this. We need the shift of thinking, really, that is um, in order to to get to a better place and to to change how we're doing things. Maybe that's something you would like to respond to, as well as other things that that Ernesto mentioned. Yes, definitely. First of all, I wanted to also offer a couple of thoughts about uh, uh, Ernesto's artworks. Of course, as Ernesto himself mentions, uh, it's one thing seeing images of sculptures and installations, and it's another thing altogether actually experiencing those sculptures and installations from within. But even from the limited perspective offered by the images, uh, it is very clear to me that the subject of much of Ernesto's art is, the, is not vegetal appearance or disappearance, but it's the appearing and the disappearing. There is a big difference, both linguistically and phenomenologically, philosophically, between an appearance and an appearing. So Ernesto, I think, gives us access to the appearing of plants, not to the appearance. He's not representing plants, but their effects of what, what, they, what it is that they give uh, like the play of light and shadow in the crown of a tree, for instance. And the same with the disappearing, with deforestation, and all this devastating uh, landscape that appears in, in, in a condensed form uh, in the other installation. Uh, so I really appreciate this because uh, I think philosophically, I'm trying to deal with a somewhat uh, similar uh, subject matter, not so much plants as, as figures as represented in thought, but precisely the appearing of plants and the disappearing of plants and the effects that that leaves behind, both giving us an enormous gift uh, uh, of, of thinking of the senses of actually of our physiological being, breathing, eating, and so on, a gift that we keep receiving and that we can never be fully completely grateful for, uh, uh, can, can never think enough for, uh, and the, the effects of the disappearing, uh, uh, what is called deforestation in a very dry language, but does not really begin to address this disappearing, this retreat of the vegetal, which is the retreat of a livable and living world as such, right? And uh, uh, in, in the book uh, on St. Hildegard of Bingen that you, you mentioned, uh, Stefano, actually, uh, I frame, I think even though St. Hildegard lived almost a thousand years before us, she saw this drama very clearly, this drama that plays itself out between what she calls viriditas, which is the green in green, the self-refreshing power of finite existence, that is actually embodied and encapsulated in plants. That's why she's giving it a, a certain color, green, right? It's not an essence, but, uh, but actually something right there on the surface, a color green, the, the green that greens forth on the one hand, and ariditas on the other hand, ariditas as the dryness, the drying up of that, that existence, as the desert, the existential desert of the finite, uh, self-refreshing power running uh, precisely dry and no longer being able to uh, renew itself. So she saw this drama very well, I think, almost a thousand years ago. And I think that Ernesto's uh, artworks also present us with a drama, give us a very uh, sensuous and sensory access to it, also triggering and stimulating uh, uh, our thinking about it. Uh, but Stefano, you were, you were saying, yes, so plants as, as an entry point uh, to the ecological uh, 
uh, disaster, global ecological disaster that we're living through. Uh, this was just, uh, th these were two examples, I think, of such an entry point, both uh, via Ernesto's art and uh, through St. Hildegard's ecological uh, theology. But if you keep in mind what I said a little bit earlier about uh, plant being uh, of the same, literally of the same root, linguistic root as nature, fusis and futon in Greek, then by accessing uh, uh, the unique characteristics of plants, of everything that plants are capable of. Uh, and, and by the way, even when I talk to plant scientists who are uh, researching the subject of vegetal intelligence, of plant intelligence, they tell me about plant capacities. We probably know maybe 5% of what plants are capable of, which means that 95% are still uh, obscured from, from our theoretical and practical view, but it's not like something, this 95% is not something that will be gradually revealed until we know everything. It's clear that the mystery of these capacities will, will remain uh, uh, regardless of all the advances of our sciences. And, and that's where uh, the epistemological approach to plants as uh, intelligent beings in their own right also meets an ethical uh, limit, an ethical approach, which actually respects plants for what they, they do, for who they are, and not only for what uh, they can be studied as, right? And this distinction between who and what uh, is probably at the core of uh, a different kind of an approach to plants and to ecosystems and to ecology, uh, understanding that uh, ecosystems are also not a what, not a collection of different things put together somehow, but a who, right? And and there is, uh, it seems like a very uh, simple difference between who and what, but the question of who is this who is a very deep, profound question that can never be answered. It has to remain at the level of a question because we can only determine a who by a what, by reducing to a, to, to a what, and therefore losing the, the who-ness, the, who, the, the very uh, core of this who. And it reminds me of the conversation we were having just in preparation of, of, of our uh, talk today, uh, where Ernesto was referring to the word planta in Portuguese and that it's in the feminine, so a plant is a she uh, necessarily, not, not so much an it. So uh, uh, determined in this, uh, in this sense, it, it, we are talking about plants as, as a who. Uh, and in many mystical traditions, uh, you know, for instance, in, in Jewish mysticism and Hindu uh, traditions, uh, who is the one of the highest mystical levels that we can reach, a level where all knowledge, all objective, objectifying knowledge stops and where we can only experience the effects of that who on us without determining and pinpointing and identifying this who as a what. And I, I hope that this is the vegetal access point to ecology, to ecosystems, understood precisely as, as who and not as what. Yeah, I like this who. I didn't know this way of saying about that, but yes. Who is, who is in the back there? There is someone in every plant. There is someone in every being in this uh, cosmic dance that we live, you know, on the galaxies, on there is a, there is a spirit there. And this is, you know, uh, what came to me uh, listening here now, Michael, and listening to this question is that in Venice in 2017, we have one position that was very clear and is still clear for me, uh, I think, it's very important for Western society to learn with the shamans, you know, with the shamans, they are scientists, you know, is a different way of making science. And as, as science in this uh, 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 amazing expanding that science is happening. And these guys like uh, Mikhail and other philosophers and scientists are uh, studying the plants, are the plants who are teaching these uh, other dimension of collaboration, you know, uh, that they have to each other in in in, uh, in this uh, showing that is much more about collaboration than about competition, now, yeah? and and many things like that to be a little bit uh, just to stay in the political point of view, but the reality is that the shamans they know about that and the indigenous in general because, uh, as far as I understand, uh, the indigenous uh, spirituality and knowledge is, is shamanic, 
you know, so there is a shaman, but the whole society is shamanist, you know, and these guys, they know a lot of stuff, you know, that's uh, no doubt everybody knows that people go there, learn if the shamans, the principles of the medicines, like the curari, for example, or like the poison of the jararaca, or cascavel, I don't know which one of them, that is used to make operations on the heart of human beings, that it stops the heart, you can make the operation, then close, super expensive, people make a lot of money with that, and this is knowledge is all stolen, you know? But, uh, so people know that they know, and uh, the problem, in my understanding, that is a arrogance, and I think this is, is about the cultural question uh, about the, the problem that we live. In, in my understanding, you know, uh, we, uh, we, you know, I am, I don't know what I am. You know, I am, a, you know, as a Brazilian, I am an invasor and I am invaded. You know, I am a Western, but also I am an indigenous, but also I am an Afro-Brazilian, you know, because I have no idea what's the composition of my thing, but of course I had a Western education and I have a lot of privileges. Uh, sometimes if I am with a friend of mine, uh, whiter than me, the, the street guy, uh, many times the street kid would ask him for money and not for me, you know? But if I am with a really black guy beside me, they are gonna ask me and not him. So there is this kind of mix in my country. But in, in understanding the Western society, at some point we lose our position in the center of the planet. Now we lose the position that the sun was spinning around us. You know, Galileo, Copernic, all these problems, big five, the church crazy, how come? Uh, the number zero was also not, not accepted because it would be the void and void was not accepted because the void of God. But all this process of, you know, rationality, the enchantment, you know, there is a process of the enchantment of the European people, which is very dramatic and, and very hard with the women, by the way, but I'm not trying to don't open too much. Uh, um, the situation is that we, we become not being the center of the universe anymore, but we become the guys of the culture. We produce telephones, you know, we send spaceships, man and moon, and we became so proud of our cultural uh, dimension that we became sick of our cultural dimension and we became arrogant to other types of uh, knowledge that is not exactly the knowledge that is cultivated by the West. And, and one day I saw a little boy look into the telephone and he looked like that, you know, and I saw this is as the lake of the Narcissus, you know, mm -hmm. this black mm -hmm. image, the lake of the Narcissus. And in my understanding is that where we are now, because things that I say since many years, because I'm talking about nature and the devotion of nature since always, you know, it's not by chance that I met the Hunikuin and the indigenous people in the forest and they had this understanding of this incredible high level of spirituality that they have and how this spirituality, it is science at the same time. And it is art at the same time because it's dancing and singing and is uh, and dancing, singing and playing that you find nature, you find knowledge, you know? And oh, this is nature. You see nature. Mm. Music. And then, uh, and then what's the situation now? We have to come out of our pedestal and go down to earth, take our shoes, humbly walk over the earth and feel that connection, the mother earth, you know, and these guys who are really connected to mother earth, which are the indigenous people from uh, America, uh, Amerindians, from Africa to, you know, in Asia to even in the north of Europe, the Sami mm -hmm. people, you know, these guys, they can, they can help the, this movement, you know, we can't do that by me. We, when I say me, I say me, the Western guy, Brazilian, because we just studied the West in Brazil, you know, mm -hmm. even though we have a mother, indigenous mother and a, 
you know, Afro mother, we don't study them, you know, because this is not right. It's not a good thing. You know? Oh my God, the indigenous people, oh, Afro. <laughs> we need to, you know, be humble. And you know, Ernesto, also, uh, we were talking about the collaborative nature of plants, that they're not competitive, but first of all, collaborative. It's the same, I feel, with uh, these traditions of knowing that are uh, outside the dominant Western fold. And by outside the fold, I, I mean uh, uh, that, that within Europe itself, within what, what we call European cultural intellectual history, there is also the other within which is the mystical traditions, which is why I turn, for instance, to St. Hildegard of Bingen, which is why I'm fascinated by Jewish mysticisms of the medieval book of Zohar, of, of the Kabbalah. Uh, and there is this a very interesting resonance between these mystical traditions, the other within Europe, uh, uh, Hindu, for instance, traditions that also talk in the Vedic hymns, for instance, about the highest divinity as a who, as Ka, this un unknown God, just as in the uh, Hebrew mysticism, uh, one of the highest emanations of God, the female emanation, by the way, called Bina, is only known as a me, as a who as well. So you will find these incredible resonances among traditions from all over the world that are outside the, the Western fold, even within the West, what is called the West itself. Um, and and uh, I think that these resonances are not there by chance because they are learning from plants actively. It is the shared experience of being with plants, of delivering oneself, body and soul to a plant and learning from them. And it is not by chance that in many of these traditions, the whole universe, the whole world is pictured as a cosmic tree, as a big tree on which all beings, whether animals, humans or plants are branches, leaves and flowers and so on. And so this is this is a kind of, we would say, archetypal image, but it is not there uh, through some sort of universal structure in human thinking. It is there thanks to uh, the experience of being with and learning from plants that has persisted all over the world and even within Europe that tried to stem it out uh, within this uh, internal uh, European other. And just a quick word on uh, anthropocentrism that I think you were referring to in this hubris of putting, putting the human on the pedestal. And of course, the necessity of getting out of that pedestal and getting in touch with the grass, with the, with the soil and, and so on. I think things are a little complicated there because even within the classical formulations that we would call anthropocentric now, uh, the human as a center is strangely decentered. So if we look at Aristotle's poetics, Aristotle, in his different works, he finds something unique about humans, something that needs to be admired and therefore admire, deserves putting the human on the pedestal. But in the poetics, Aristotle says that the, the one thing that the human is the best of all other beings in is in the mimetic faculty, in the, fa in the capacity of imitating all other beings. So by imitating beings who are not human, the human excels all other beings precisely by identifying with the other. So this kind of uh, mimetic capacity that we tend to admire is at the core of a part of the uh, problematic and uh, anthropocentric uh, um, uh, kind of attitude. Uh, and uh, another thing is that uh, all the way to 20th century philosophy it is always repeated, the human is the one being that has no proper place in the order of nature. So it is not just some sort of a hierarchical top of a pyramid that is naturally determined, but rather what gives this edge, this privilege to the anthropos, to the human, is precisely the placelessness. And this placelessness is what drives many of the um, uh, many of the devastating forces that have been unleashed onto the natural world, uh, all the way to uh, now these crass statements by the likes of Elon Musk, who say humans have to become the inter planetary species in order to survive. So we have destroyed this planet, but no problem. There are other planets we can move to uh, colonize, again, using all the problematic language of colonialism, now in the cosmic sense, no, no longer in the terrestrial sense. Um, and, and I think that this uh, kind of basic attitude of placelessness, not the highest place that the human occupies, but precisely an exclusion from a hierarchy of places, uh, that is a part of anthropocentrism and is not very easy to get out of. Yeah, 
Bom, this guy that you quote is one of these guys that he maybe they they are they are confessing that he one of the ones who wants to destroy the planet. Yeah, because he what he's proposing is let's destroy our planet and try to find another one. What I think is not uh, uh, you know when you think about this thing LGBT uh, uh, genders and all this thing that or even indigenous or even black people or even this racism in general that people are afraid about the other because the other is weird. You know we are the weirds one. <laughs> we are the weird one. We are the one who use shirt. You know, no other animal use a shirt. They don't need that. We are the ones that arrive in completely in fragile, and we need to invent all these processes. And we cannot live without a cell phone anymore. You know, 30 years ago we didn't need that. Even 20 years ago we didn't need that. Now we cannot live without that. So what we are making with ourselves? You know, we think, oh yeah, this is good. And this is bad. <laughs> Let's cut that to have more of this. You know, we are this weird. But when we say human, you know, we, we, it's not all the human so culture, all the human society. There is one society that one day pick up the earth, the earth as a body, body mother earth, and transform that in landscape. And mm. through that, putting... Uh, ourselves outside of them, we begin to see, oh, the sun now is here, the sun now is there, this is star move here, move here, and begin to practice uh, science in this uh, kind of materialistic way, being separated to this universe. No other society, uh, as Michael just said about the who, you know, all, all other societies around the planet were connected to, to nature. Uh, China, India, Japan, all the, the, the Asian society is connected to nature. In young is about nature. African society is connected to nature. This is nature. Indigenous society, absolutely connected to nature. The one that disconnect, and this disconnection, no doubt, develop all this technology, okay? And I don't know how, even if I say this is great or this is not so good or this is terrible, you know, but the only one that disconnect themselves to nature is the one that become more powerful and begin to spread out together with the Christianism. That that's the way things are. And that's how we need to think about. And we need to separate from nature because the Christianism comes from the Platonism, you know, and Platonism was the separation, the separation between the body and, and the mind, you know? And, and this is a problem that we have. And I, I, feel, I understand that you can, know, we can make walks, we can make protests, we can avoid stopping buying things from Amazon, like I said before, okay? But it, this is not gonna solve the problem if we don't go deep on the beginning of it and understand that at some point we had a choice. And this choice was to put, transform the planet Earth nature in a landscape. And now we are far from this landscape and we are having problems with that because we are part of this landscape. We cannot put never us out of the landscape. Even if we take airplane, a uh, spaceship. I mean, I want to be an astronaut. That was my dream. You know, the reality when I was a kid, I want to be an astronaut. Teacher asked, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? He said, I want to be an astronaut. And the girl, my friend that I had in that time when I was very little, many years later, when I was 18, uh, I met her and said, I remember when you asked, uh, the teacher asked people where every, everyone want to be. And I get very angry for her. I said, why you get angry? For her? Because you said you want to be an astronaut. And she said, this is not a profession. Well, perhaps if I said I want to be an artist, it would be not be a professional. But uh, even though if you pick up a spaceship and go to Mars, anywhere you go, you're gonna still be inside of the landscape. You're gonna still be inside of the body of nature, the body of this big body that the, the earth is a, just a miracle. Earth is a miracle, be alive now, it's a miracle. You know, uh, it's like Einstein said, some people don't believe in miracle. There is other people who think that every second, <laughs> everything is a miracle. Thank you. Know, you. So, uh, Thank let's, you. Let's take care of this miracle. Yes, you, ab Ernesto. absolutely. I think uh, I think Stefano is going to uh, wrap up the conversation. But again, I think uh, 
it would be beautiful if with every breath we were mindful of the fact that it is a gift from the presence of the plants to us. If we have uh, any questions, we can ask uh, one question um, before the end. Um, Anyone from the so audience uh, would like to ask a question? Um, we have, uh, what, what it makes me think, of course, is that yes, we, we, we have to imitate plants in the way that plants, they can't go anywhere. As you said, Michael, in, in a lot of your writing, plants can't really move very far away. Whereas, um, so we kind of, so they have to adapt to their environment. They don't try and escape it like we try and escape to Mars or <laughs> uh, get the plane and go somewhere else. So there's something very uh, poetic in the fact that like plants, we need to learn to deal with our local environment, our natural environment around us and, and adapt to it rather than uh, the other way around. Um, we have one question. Um, Christina says, absolutely agree. Gender, woke, trans is divisions, not the connector separator. Um, what do you think of Edouard Glissant's theory of the archipelago? And, uh, and we have Lucy that says, uh, we see such beauty in plants, for instance, trees. It's almost like a magnetic pool. Plants don't have eyes, but on some level, do you think they're aware of this beauty that they possess? Um, maybe if, if you have in one minute, if you have <laughs> any res responses to those uh, questions. Yeah, I, I just like to respond. The one that plants doesn't have eyes. I don't know the other one, Edward. Yeah, I would like to know, but I don't. Uh, plants doesn't have eyes, but they see everything. Yes, and, and of course, we have to remember that plants don't have eyes in the way in which we imagine eyes based on our own, uh, on our own face and its projection onto other beings, but plants do have photosensitive cells, so they perhaps see even better than we do because they, they catch many more wavelengths of far red, for instance, which is very important for them, uh, uh, the, the, the light of the sun just before sunset, for instance. So the spectrum, the visible spectrum that plants uh, actually receive is much greater than what the human eye can receive. Uh, but concerning the question of beauty, uh, yes, I think there, there is, uh, 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 most likely, there is a kind of awareness, perhaps a greater awareness, once again, uh, by plants of, uh, of the beauty that they themselves present because uh, they uh, give the insects and not, not only humans, but uh, first insects and many other living beings, uh, the wonderful display of different shapes and forms and colors specifically colors and smells, of course, aromas uh, that, that, that have developed over uh, very long spans of time. Uh, so in the co-evolution of, of plants and other living beings, uh, the, the vegetal awareness of beauty must be, must be present. So I, I definitely believe that that's the case. Uh, I, I'd like to answer about beauty. Uh, I think mm -hmm. beauty, everything has beauty. Beauty is inside of us. Beauty is inside everything and it's not outside. And uh, once again, is the mistake of uh, this materialist understanding that the beauty is outside of us. The beauty is inside of us. The same person can isolate uh, sadness as they can isolate beauty. And perhaps in the same day, you know, one person can look to you and see you. And later, someone can see you full of beauty. You know, so beauty is something inside of us and it's something very important that uh, is inside of our heart, you know, is very, 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 very small little, little bird inside of our mm -hmm. heart. Uh, and this is something that we need, it's very important that we cultivate this, this, this uh, little bird uh, named beauty, you know, and it's much beyond what we can see on the TV or uh, announced in the magazines, you know. And, and maybe, maybe Ernesto, just to add to this thought, maybe beauty is neither on the purely on the inside nor purely on the outside, but somewhere in between the two, in, not in the appearance, but in the appearing itself, as, uh, as I, I was talking about your beautiful works of art that, that pay so much attention and lead us toward the vegetal appearing and the vegetal disappearing, the gerundive, 
uh, uh, form as opposed to, so, so beauty is beauty in, which is neither purely within nor purely outside. It is rendering beautiful in this, in this sense. I like very much that. I like very much this appearing. Appearing comes into the appearing. Mm -hmm. Because it agree. makes the, thing, the idea of a happening, something that is happening. Yes. And this idea that something is happening is something very important in all my works because they are always in the, in the state of suspension, most of the time, let's say, in a state of suspension, that is something is happening all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very, uh, very delicious to hear this appearing from you. <laughs> I totally agree. Then, and the your work is is opening, giving us access to this beauty as well, which we all very much appreciate. We, um, Gabriela, thank you very much for your question. But we are going to have to end. Gabriela asked, um, "What do you think about plants using cooperation to evolve in contrast with animals who compete in a Darwin sense? Uh, do you think society needs to learn from that cooperation?" It's a great question. Unfortunately, we probably can't talk. We can't respond to the question. And let's do it. Very quick, I think Ernest Gutt, the, the farmer, Ernest Gutt can teach you because uh, they are all together. The animals are brothers of the plants, uh, brothers and sisters. And very, very quickly also on the question of cooperation, I think uh, one thing we haven't talked about, even though I mentioned the, the word synergy, is energy, right? And the way that plants obtain their energy, receive their energy, are energized, is precisely by opening themselves up uh, on their above ground portions to solar energy, right? So they work synergically with the elements, cooperating with them. Uh, uh, instead of extracting, instead of taking, they, they open themselves up and in that sense are energized. So uh, I think synergy and cooperation, they have to go together and would lead us also toward thinking about energy otherwise and learning this being energized from, from plants. And, and Stefan in the audience mentions the last message to humanity by the monkey Coco, help earth hurry, nature sees you. And that as a follow on from that, what would be your last message for the audience today? Um, what could they, what would be your one recommendation action that, that the audience can take away that you would recommend? Um, of course, maybe you've already mentioned it, but just uh, briefly one action. And if you have any uh, reading that you would also recommend or something that you've seen that you would recommend uh, just to finish off our talk today. A brief joy and blow love. That's my thinking for today. Yes, and for, for me, the action I would recommend is just go out there. Don't stay inside next to the computer. Go to a place of plants. Deliver yourself to a place where that, that is the place of the plants. Breathe deeply and linger with them. Just linger. And mm. then maybe something will happen. Claudia, any, any final thoughts? Any, I know you're both very big readers. Is there anything you want to recommend for to read? Uh, I, I recommend the book from Sylvia Frederic, Frederic, The Caliban and the Witches. In, in my case, uh, a big discovery for me was the Bhagavad Gita from the, the Hindu tradition. And this, this is really opens up a whole new world of thinking, which at the same time resonates with many of the insights we've, we've had today. Thank you. Claudia, do you have any final remarks? Um, nothing but gratitude, honestly. Um, and I think uh, it shows that this conversation, it evolved very organically. The questions we had prepared were just a little introductory thread. And I think there's a real curiosity um, between our two invited speakers today, which I think is, uh, is the biggest gift we can have as uh, organizers of the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much from me as well. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm sure from all of our audience for sharing these insightful thoughts and uh, from the Fondation Tali. And um, for everybody watching, uh, you can re-watch this conversation on Facebook on our website or share it. Uh, it will be on YouTube as well. We're working on an audio version. So um, please do sign up as well to our newsletter or Instagram to hear about all the upcoming talks. And the next talk, just to announce, is at the uh, École Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. 
Um, so if you're in Paris on the Wednesday, the 27th of October, there will be a talk with the artist Tino Segal and uh, Agnes Sinai, who's the founder of Institute Momentum, to talk about creating without destroying. And uh, again, an audio version will be made for those unable to join in Paris. And uh, that's all I have time. we have time for today, but thank you all very much again. And I wish everybody a, a wonderful evening. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Obrigada. <laughs> thank you.